Good morning. My name is Eric Johnson. I'm a veterinarian from Marietta, Georgia, dogs and cats mostly with a specialty in fish health. I've had fish as pets since 1973 and uh, kept fish for many years before somebody taught me about the cycle. I was thinking about that the other day, uh, how long I kept fish before somebody explained to me about ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, which assuming you've gotten all the way through to this video, you already know about ammonia, nitrite, nitrate. Um, but yeah, so it's been a long, long road, made a lot of mistakes. And uh, so here I am giving you pointers. I've been in practice, uh, geez, 22 years, seeing fish most of that time. I was really intense in it for about 10 years and then slowed down. Uh, so right now I'm doing some outreach, bringing you this video. This video is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'll double check, but I think it's 17th in the series of 20, and it's about viruses. And uh, it's a big subject. Hopefully, I'll be able to get it covered in one sitting uh, here in the car. Um, there will be some video support, you know, picture support of what some of these fish look like, and maybe some high points will be enumerated right along uh, the bottom here, um, and some flash screens that come up. Anyway, so let's get started. We could talk a lot about viruses that affect tropical fish, and I can um, briefly. We're going to blow through most of the viruses pretty quick, and then I'm going to talk to you about the two of the main viruses. Um, a virus that you're going to see in tropical fish tanks is one called lymphocystis, and it is a virus particle that uh, causes the cells in the fish skin to become gigantic and uh, swell and it makes white kind of white crusty looking or nodular lesions on the fish and hopefully i'll have a picture i can upload of a i think i have a scatophagus that has lymphocystis classically and you can tell about lymphocystis if you look at it under the microscope uh, if you take a little piece of that material and look at it under the microscope you'll see uh, megakaryons or megalocytes, they're gigantic cells, a huge nucleus, and, and uh, they're very big. You don't even have to stain them to tell it's lymphocystis. But those giant cells um, prove that it's lymphocystis, and then you know. But lymphocystis virus, uh, it's infectious. It does transmit. It doesn't transmit very easily. And typically, when you start seeing lymphocystis, it's a fish that is under some stress and has some damage to the skin to let the virus particle actually in. And this is actually true for a lot of viruses of fish. Um, but so that's lymphocystis. And apparently there's a treatment, uh, which I've tried once, and it actually worked kind of okay, but I ended up having to do this treatment so frequently, I felt like it was um, almost not worth it. I was repeatedly dipping the fish in uh, acroflavine baths, cleared it. I had to do it like three times, it was a pain. Fortunately, lymphocystis is rare. So to recap lymphocystis, the long and the short of it is you're looking at fish that are kind of stressed. You start to see white, crustyish looking lesions on the edges of the fins, somewhere on the body, but usually the fins. Um, and um, that can be lymphocystis. If you need to confirm or prove that, that it's not carp pox or, you know, columnaris bacteria or even fungus, you can just look at what you scrape off in those areas and it's going to be large cells. Uh, treatment may be acroflavine and improving water quality for the fish. A little bit of warmth, give them their immune system back, and they might be able to take care of it on their own. So that's lymphocystis. There are a couple of viruses that affected fish uh, tropicals over the years. There was an angelfish virus, which I don't know much about. Uh, as I came onto the scene uh, in fish health, that virus was around and then seems to have been mostly corrected. I don't see or hear about uh, people telling me that their angelfish are dying off, baby angelfish dying off in large groups. Uh, there was a lot of what I saw when I first got out and was treating fish where uh, folks had the angelfish virus and they brought them to my clinic and I looked at them and they had costia uh, or overwhelming flukes or another case where they had enormous amounts of ick cysting in the gills and not so much other places. That was mysterious. Um, so it doesn't have to be a gold, uh, angelfish virus. There was a virus, I think, that got guppies for a while. 
uh, that was kind of a thing. Uh, again, I don't know very much about that virus, and I'm, I, I, based on its rarity uh, these days, I'm not aware that it's still tearing up fish. If you know that it is or have an idea on that, leave me a note in the comments, and I will get to that and then modify this video, I suppose. Um, so outside of that, those are mostly the tropical fish kind of things. There's some viruses that affect koi and goldfish, fish tank or pond of some significance. One of them is carp pox. Carp pox is a little bit different than uh, regular viruses uh, and different from lymphocystis in that what it creates are milky, look like milky or waxy white droplets on the surface of the fish or fins. Um, it can be a big disfiguring deal, but seldom if ever kills a fish. Um, I saw one that, whose tail was mostly you eat up with that, and it had some trouble getting around, and its condition declined as it was, you know, impaired as far as getting um, up with the rest of the fish competing for food as much as it probably should have. Um, that was one, and then there was another one that had some uh, carp pox lesions around the mouth, a couple that had their vision obscured in one or both eyes by the proliferation of that virus. Just nuisance factor. Um, carp pox is funny because it's one of those things that can show up during certain parts of the year and go away during certain parts of the year. And guess what? That has to do with the waxing and waning of the immune system. A lot of times people will say that their carp gets carp pox during this uh, winter. And in the summer, yay, it goes away, he's better. But then in the fall, it comes back again when the water chills down. I'm pulling over to stop off at a bathroom, and I'll be back with you momentarily. I'm back. Thank you for your patience. Um, we were talking about carp pox and how it appears as white waxy lesions on the surfaces of koi mainly, and then some goldfish and um, can be debilitating, maybe a little, sometimes, kind of, maybe, not really a big deal. Disfiguring to certain fish, yeah, uh, the Goldfish Museum people with the super expensive fish, they can't stand it when it shows up, because uh, it presents kind of a liability to their other fish because it is transmissible, not crazy hot transmissible. It's a lot like uh, papillomavirus, where it depends on stress and uh, defects in the skin to get a start. Um, so, I mean, it, it can transmit and it can mean the end of uh, certain fish's career if it shows up in white, uh, black areas, uh, it can be unsightly. Um, but as far as a disease that you need to treat, not really. So when you see that, you can tell somebody, you know, eh, well, you know, it, it appears to be a virus and it'll wax and wane, <laughs> wax uh, and wane. Per season, uh, unlikely ever to be curable, uh, but not necessarily a big a big deal as far as transmission. Okay, so that's uh, carp pox. There are two other viruses I want to cover. They're kind of a big deal. We're going to spend a little bit more time on the first one, which is spring viremia of carp (SVC), um, because I'm not covering it in most of my other videos. I have a, two entire videos on koi herpes virus, so I'm going to hit that light. In fact, why don't I do that first, because it's going to be a light hit. And if you want more on koi herpes virus, there's a video, uh, two other videos in my uh, channel about that. So koi herpes virus showed up, I suppose it was in the early 90s, mid-90s, if I'm not mistaken, 1996, it showed up. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, and there's a lot of finger pointing involved, it might have had its start in Israel and then into a group of fish in England, where it kind of showed up at that point because um, there's a lot more information surrounding koi in England. In other words, it's higher profile and a lot of fish died and became a thing. And then um, some fish ended up in America. And uh, what happened was some of those fish that were in America with this particular problem ended up sold at a uh, major koi show on the East Coast. And those fish went home to all those hobbyist houses. Um, and then the fish started dying like crazy. Koi herpes virus is funny. It's temperature dependent. And when it gets into the low 70s, it activates. 
so you could have fish with koi herpes virus all day long at 67 degrees and nothing happens. Uh, and then they get into water that's like 70 something degrees and it, it opens up and just kills 80 to 90 even more of your fish, 80 to 90 percent of your fish and they die quickly. So it's not dribbles and drabs over the course of a month. It's like massive mortalities within a week tapering off to leave you with 10% of your fish by the end of two weeks. It's pretty much the cycle that that goes through. Um, when you're losing fish fast and hard, um, there are other things that can cause that, like a vastly sagging pH or costia is a rapid killer, especially in early spring. Kilodenella, Kilodenella also a rapid killer, but you rule those things out, you got to start thinking about koi herpes virus. Temperature dependent, kind of interesting I said that because some, the Israelis had done some work on koi herpes virus where they were trying to create immunity. Try and follow me here. This is a big deal. They were trying to create immunity. So what they would do is they would infect the koi with koi herpes virus. They would let them get out to a point and then they would superheat them um, to... Uh, stop the virus from, from uh, proliferating with the idea of re-exposing them later and creating three separate exposures um, to create antibodies to the, to the virus. So they would infect them, they would superheat them, um, and then they would uh, give them a minute and then they would reinfect them and um, superheat them and then they, they would do that three times and then there was uh, your immune fish. All right. So... Here's what's funny. The, the fish over here are not in Israel, but the work is the same. Let me explain that. Seven or ten years ago, I came out and said we could cure these koi herpes virus fish with heat. 83 degrees. <laughs> Losses stop. Fish do fine unless they were too far gone. If the gills are wrecked, they're, they're probably not going to turn around. If they're all skinny and pinch-headed and eyes are sunk in, likely they're not going to do well. But uh, by and large, you'll save most fish with koi herpes virus by heating them to 83 degrees. No, 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 that can't be the case. Can't be, oh, you're Eric, you're full of shit. It's just, that's not true. You can't cure a koi herpes virus. Well, the funny thing is I'm not a genius. That's what the Israelis were doing every single time. They were trying to work on a, on a vaccine and an immunity in these fish, so they were infecting them with koi herpes virus and then inactivating the virus with, with uh, heat. How could you look at that research and not know that that's what's going on? And you go, well, how do you know they, it cured those fish? Well, because they had to reinfect them. They didn't just put them back into the 70s and then have them re-break with koi herpes virus. They literally had to infect them again with koi herpes virus. They were showing over and over again that the virus is what they call heat labile. It means that heat breaks down the capsid around the virus and kills it, spills the DNA. And uh, how do you know it gets out of the tissues? Well, see, that virus isn't exactly a lenti. It doesn't go into the DNA and hang out. Um, it's infectious form. And most of the time, intracellularly, it is a virus particle that you can kill with heat. Anyway, I was like, fine, don't believe me. I, I don't care. I've done, I've done my share. You know, I, I can put this information out in front of you, and you can let your fish die of koi herpes virus if you want. Um, but in case you're looking for information about viruses and you stray into my koi herpes virus discussion and you want to save a mess of fish, you can heat them gradually and safely with lots of oxygenation up to about 83 degrees and the losses will stop and the fish will improve and there you go. Um, one caveat to that though is that when you heat fish that high, uh, especially under stress like that virus, um, the red will run. In other words, uh, you could end up with fish that had red in them and you could end up with fish that don't have any red in them. It happens. Maybe better than being dead. I'll let you decide. Can I sit here and say that they are not infectious after heating them up? No, they might be. But if I had a, ba a batch of fish and I had one in there named Warthog that I loved and had carried over from Japan in a, a handbag 10 years ago and I really wanted it to live, I would heat my fish and I would just 
suck it up as far as whether they're infectious or not. And if I was a moral person, I would not expose anybody else's fish to my Koi herpes virus heat treated salvaged fish till we know for sure. Um, there was a study done at the University of Georgia um, that where fish were infected and superheated and then re-examined for virus particle and they were negative. That study drew to an unexpected close uh, for lack of more fish to test uh, and finances. But uh, the preliminaries on that were very encouraging. The thing is, is that just the absence of a, of a virus you can actually see with electron microscopy doesn't mean the virus isn't there. You could be testing the wrong tissue or whatever. So nobody was going to stick their neck out. I get that. So Koi herpes virus, to recap, basically is a virus that is extremely contagious. It's inactive in cold water. It is inactivated in hot water. And somewhere in the mid-70s, it's very active. And it kills 85 to 90% of your fish. And um, there is no um, treatment, really, except heat to inactivate the virus. Uh, the fish need to be protected from infection. They get secondary infections with bacteria, Aeromonas usually. And um, to avoid Coherbris virus, you want to use a quarantine. And this isn't everything I've ever written. Uh, it's quarantine in the mid-70s so that if it's going to break, it breaks. And if the fish are valuable, be ready to heat them up to 83 degrees in quarantine. And uh, things are going to be all right. Um, we can move on to the next virus. I'm going to pause my video, got to go see a doctor, and uh, I'll be right back. So this is a, an addendum to the uh, virus discussion. We had gotten kind of through some of the um, viruses of tropical freshwater fish, like the guppy virus and the angelfish virus that I honestly didn't know very much about, still don't. Um, I believe they're mostly over, haven't heard about them lately, um, and I mentioned that uh, some of those uh, virus cases actually turned out to be uh, fast killers like Kiladinella and Costia, uh, clearing up those parasites usually with salt, um, suddenly resolved in resolution of the viral signs. Uh, and then I'm sure that there were others that, that were a virus. Good research probably went into that. I don't know. And then we talked about koi herpes virus, mainly an issue with koi, not goldfish, in ponds, sometimes uh, quarantine and holding facilities, and that there has been controversy about whether or not heat solves the problem um, and the fact that the Israelis had done more than their share of research on trying to create immunity in the fish by infecting them, heating them, reinfecting them, heating them, reinfecting them, and heating them to create immune fish. And uh, how, if you just look at those facts, it suggests that heat inactivates the virus. And then if they have to be reinfected, obviously the virus has been eliminated from those fish. Otherwise, it would just come back out of remission and work on their immune system. Anyway... So we could finally get around to spring viremia of carp. That is the purpose of this section in the uh, assessing viral pathogens video. Relative to spring viremia of carp, it is a big deal and then not a big deal. What do I mean by that? Okay, so let's say you ran a business and you had fish that were dying of Aeromonas or Pseudomonas bacterial infections. And you had pretty much ruled everything else out as far as a cause. Like your water quality was good and handling was minimal. And the fish are showing sores and there's no parasitism going on. So it's kind of like, I wonder what's causing these infections. And then the government comes in. God love them. And they test for a virus and they find spring viremia of carp. Well... At that point, because of the way regulations have been, uh, they have to destroy uh, your business. Well, what I mean by that is they have to destroy all your fish, which, of course, if you're in the fish business, destroys your business. And they all shut you down. And there's been some legislation that says that if they kill all your fish and put you out of business, they have to pay you some compensation so that you can keep feeding your family. The problem is, is that there's actually a lot of legislation that looks like that, but there's no money set aside to make those payments. So it's kind of like, well, yeah, you know, we're supposed to pay you, but it didn't get funded this year. Uh, well, never was funded, but it's a, it's the thought that counts. I'm salty on that. 
I saw a good friend of mine get hurt pretty badly by spring viremia of carp. And what's funny about that is, is that as that case and other cases unfolded, they found out that spring viremia of carp is in a lot of fish, a lot of carp, wild carp. Of course, it doesn't seem to make much difference because spring viremia doesn't necessarily flare up and it doesn't necessarily potentiate bacterial infections. But when it does, it's disturbing. So you kind of don't want to be tested have your fish tested for SVC, spring viremia of carp, because of the impact on your business. So you're going to find a considerable amount of underreporting. But what is also interesting is after that debacle with the spring viremia of carp, where they put uh, one of the major suppliers of domestic koi in the doghouse for a year or three, is that SVC testing accomplished a very low enforcement priority because it was such a cluster. When um, the Fed figured out they had SVC, they wanted to um, take all the water out of their ponds. Instead of discharging it into the river, they wanted to take all the water out of their ponds with helicopters carrying transfer trucks and take the water inland and dump it someplace where it wouldn't get to fish. And uh, that's when they started testing fish in the river nearby to see whether or not the infection had gotten into the indigenous population of carp. And they found out, in fact, that it did get into the indigenous population of carp. Oh, well, they tested fish elsewhere, too, for SVC, and they found it in those fish. And another place they found it in wild fish. And that's when they started realizing, hey, SVC is in a lot of fish, not just near this hatchery. And the spending was outrageous, and the business impact was huge, and they, the government basically at that point, the people in charge of that investigation said, you know what, we're just not, it's a don't ask, don't tell. All right, let's back up a little, let's back up a second and look at spring viremia of carp as a virus. Um, that virus what it does basically is under the right circumstances, it goes in and it stresses the fish out real bad and makes them vulnerable to secondary infections like pseudomonas and, and uh, aeromonas. So the fish uh, develop signs of bacterial infection for no good reason. Normally you'll see bacterial infections in fish that are cold or chewed on by parasites or overhandled or have been shipped seven times or whatever. With spring viremia of carp, all you need is like spring and fish with SVC. And the virus starts working on the fish and opens them up to bacterial infections. When you see fish dying of SVC, they are not dying of SVC. They're dying of bacterial infections that happened because of the SVC. There is a uh, researcher named uh, Shepper Kloss in Germany. And what he showed in his research on SVC was that if you take SVC infected fish with the lesions and you treat them with antibiotics and clear up the infections, they do fine. They don't die of SVC. They die of the bacterial infections. And if you control that with medicated food or injections of antibiotics or whatever, uh, those fish do okay. Shepherd Kloss was doing injections in fish as early as, I don't know, 1947, 1950. Um, a true pioneer. And you can find his book. They're big fat books. Uh, by Shepherd Kloss. It's S-C-H-A with an umlaut over it. P-E-R-C-L-A-U-S. I've been through those books. They are awesome. Um, anyway, so the spring viremia of carp is a reportable disease. That means if it's you test for it or you have somebody test for it or a university comes in and tests for it and it's positive, you've got jackbooted researchers coming in, shutting you down, killing your fish, even if you're residential in the backyard. But they're trying not to do that. They really don't even want to test for it. They don't want to get drawn back into that cluster. And so it's really right now smoldering. Not a big deal. But that virus is out there. I get it. And it could be a big threat. And it does hurt people sometimes because it triggers these responses. And fish get bacterial infections. And it takes a lot of work to pull them around. But as far as being a killer virus right now, not so much. So that is spring viremia of carp. It is the sudden unexplained outbreak of bacterial infections in fish, and it's caused by a virus that potentiates those infections.
I think we covered most of the viruses, but you know, when you're doing an unscripted video and driving along in your car and trying to remember everything right off the top of your head, you forget stuff. So if I have forgotten something or there's a resource I promised you that I didn't give you, um, leave a note in the comments and I would really appreciate it. Thanks. Let's get on to the next subject.